Good morning, economics, and welcome back. We're going to uh, do this slide a little differently. I mean, we don't have video up of me speaking. I hope that is uh, okay. I'm just going to keep it as an audio file here. It'll help keep these files a little smaller uh, for me as I upload them. And it won't. I was noticing that the video was blocking a portion of the slide. Um, during the lecture. So we're just going to have voice for this one. Try it out. I'll look for some of your feedback if it's worse or better. And going forward, we perhaps will add the video back. So here we are. We're in Unit 2 still. This is Lesson 6. Uh, we're still in the broader idea of supply. And this is wrapping up the idea of supply. In the production process, entrepreneurs bring together capital, labor, and land to produce goods and services. To build a skyscraper, as we see here, cranes and construction workers join forces on a patch of land to create a city in the sky. To make a latte, an espresso machine, a worker known as a barista, and coffee beans intermingle with piping hot water to form a beverage with a jolt of caffeine. In this lesson, we'll discuss the cost of production. We'll also explore the decision of how much to produce of anything from big buildings to little shots of espresso. Our key idea in this lesson is that firms can maximize their profit by producing the quantity that equates marginal revenue and marginal cost. And our three learning objectives for this lesson is we should be able to explain the components of total cost we're going to be able to identify the condition for profit maximization, and we're going to be able to explain how a profit maximizing entrepreneur decides whether to open a new firm and whether to shut down an existing firm. So these are the three things we are looking to do in our lecture and lesson today. To begin with, we're going to look at understanding production. The law of supply tells us that a firm wants to produce and sell more of a good when its price rises. But how does a firm decide exactly how much to produce and sell? We'll answer that question soon. Our starting point is the relationship between the amount of various inputs a firm uses and its output, the amount of a good or service the firm produces. If a coffee shop wants to sell more lattes, it will need to use more inputs. But should it hire more baristas or buy more espresso machines? And how much more of each input should it buy? As we're about to see, that depends on the nature of the inputs themselves and on how much time the firm has to make adjustments. The amount of some types of inputs can't be adjusted quickly. Previously, we discussed how it takes a long time to expand factories and assembly lines. As another example, consider a construction company that wants to expand its business. It can take several months of planning and negotiation before the company can complete the purchase of heavy equipment like cranes and bulldozers. The same is true if a company wants to downsize and sell some of the equipment it already owns. So over a time period that can last several months or more, the construction company is st stuck with the fixed quantity of cranes and bulldozers it happens to have on hand. Economists define the short run as the period of time during which the quantity of at least one input is fixed. The long run is the period of time in which the quantities of all inputs are variable. There is no set period of time that distinguishes the short run from the long run. This is determined by the time it takes to acquire new inputs in particular industries. If, in the construction industry, the quantities of all inputs could be adjusted in as few as three months, then the short run in that industry is a period of three months. If, in the education industry, it takes two years to add classroom space to a school building, then the short run in that industry is a period of two years. A fixed input is an input like cranes in classroom space 
the quantity of which cannot be changed in the short run. This means that in the short run, the quantities of fixed inputs remain the same no matter how much output the firm decides to produce. The amount of a variable input can be adjusted up or down. A construction company can quickly increase or decrease its orders of plywood, cement, or copper pipes, so these are variable inputs. Labor, too, can often be adjusted rapidly. In the construction industry, it might take just a few days to find additional workers, and these workers can be laid off with very short notice if they are not needed. So even in the short run, a construction company's labor and materials are variable inputs. In the short run, as in the long run, firms use more of their variable inputs when they produce more output and less of their variable inputs when they produce less output. In the long run, a firm can adjust the quantities of all its inputs. It can acquire a larger or smaller factory than it has now. It can get new equipment or sell the equipment it has. What were fixed inputs in the short run thus, became, thus become variable inputs in the long run. That is, in the long run, all inputs are variable inputs. To be clear, we want to make sure that we understand short run and long run as terms. We should not be confused by these, um, even with their somewhat strange or perhaps misleading um, <laughs> words in them at first. It boils down to this. In the short run, the quantity of at least one input is fixed whereas in the long run, the quantities of all inputs are variable. The inputs with fixed quantities in the short run are called fixed inputs. In the long run, even fixed inputs become variable inputs. A firm's production schedule indicates the inputs needed to produce different quantities of output. Let's look at a production schedule for a fictional lawn mowing company we'll call Blade Runner Lawn Mowing. The table below contains a production schedule for Blade Runner for a typical week. The table shows that Blade Runner uses two inputs, mowers and workers. Notice that the number of mowers is fixed at two. Here's our column for fixed input and notice it's fixed at two which means that it is two at every in every cell. We are looking at Blade Runner's production options in the short run, which in this case is several weeks because that is the amount of time it would take Blade Runner to acquire more of its fixed input mowers or sell the mowers it has. Labor, however, is a variable input. Blade Runner can quickly increase or de decrease the quantity of workers it employs. Here is our variable input column. In this case, it happens to be workers or labor. Total output here is measured by the quantity of lawns Blade Runner can mow per day. This is shown in the third column for each number of workers that Blade Runner could employ. With two employees, right, Blade Runner can mow 12 lawns per day. With three employees, it would increase to 17 lawns per day, four employees, 21 lawns per day, and so on. The information in Blade Runner's production schedule is also displayed graphically here as a production function uh, graph. Technically, the curve, which would be this line here, is the production function. Moving rightward on the graph corresponds to hiring more workers. So as we move here, this way, we are seeing an increase in the number of workers employed by Blade Runner. Moving upward on the graph corresponds to, mow, to mowing more lawns here. And again, you can see I have labeled the axes uh, there. I'm going to erase this so we can't 
draw a little bit more. The upward slope of the production function up to a quantity of seven workers, in other words, we are always going upwards um, until we reach seven, which is here. So seven is our peak. Um, so this upward slope of the production function to a quantity of seven workers shows that more lawns are mowed at each of, of the first seven workers as each of the first seven workers is hired. When the eighth worker is hired, total output decreases from 27 to 26. All right, then we now are going down. Um, when we move from, from seven to eight, to that eighth worker. The eighth worker causes output to decrease by achieving nothing except getting in the way, as discussed later in our lecture. My advice, don't be the eighth worker. So, did you get it? What does a production schedule show? Go ahead and share your answer in the discussion forum on Canvas um, at this time. Write up a quick answer and uh, share it in the discussion section. You can pause to do that. We will continue now. The last column of the production schedule in our table below reports the increase in output for each additional worker hired. Remember that economists use the word marginal to mean additional. So the increase in total output that results from hiring an additional worker is called the marginal product of labor. The table shows that for each of the first two workers Blade Runner hires, the marginal product of labor is six lawns. Here and here. Each of these workers adds six lawns to the total output of the firm. But following that last column down, you can see that after the second worker, each additional worker has a smaller marginal product than the previous worker. The marginal product is five lawns for the third worker, four lawns for the fourth worker, three lawns for the fifth worker, and so on. Let's explore why marginal product behaves this way. As more and more of a variable input like labor is added to the unchanging quantity of a fixed input like lawnmowers, congestion and redundancy cause the marginal product of labor to decline. Because Blade Runner has exactly two lawnmowers in the short run, the first and second workers can use a lawnmower full time. The third worker has the disadvantage of having to share a lawnmower with the other two workers. The third worker can mow lawns only while someone else is on break, but might be useful for fetching gasoline and removing rocks and branches from lawns before they are mowed. So the marginal product of the third worker is substantial at five, but not as high as the marginal product of six for the previous workers. As more workers are added, the mowers are spread even more thinly. More time is spent on breaks or less productive work. Each additional worker contributes less to total output than the worker before because additional workers have less equipment to work with. When the marginal product decreases as the quantity of the variable input increases, we say there is diminishing marginal productivity. You can also see the effect of diminishing marginal productivity on the graph. As the number of workers increases, total output rises by less and less with each additional hire. This is why the graph of the production schedule becomes flatter as employment continues to rise. Right? In other words, we, it's steep, 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 and then we start to flatten out here. Note that the marginal product does not decrease until the third worker is hired. There were enough mowers to allow some growth in the number of workers without a decline in marginal productivity. In many situations, the marginal product actually increases as the first few workers are added. 
Consider a dry cleaning shop in which a single worker must clean and press clothes. This worker will ha not have time to develop particular skills in either task, but with two workers, each can specialize in a task and get very good at it. Because of their increased skills and focus, marginal product will increase. However, when some inputs are fixed, sooner or later we can expect the other inputs to display diminishing marginal productivity. According to the law of diminishing according to the law of diminishing returns, as more of a variable input is used in combination with a fixed input, the marginal product will eventually decrease. It is even possible that past a certain point, additional workers would cause total output to decrease, meaning that marginal product is negative. With too many workers and only two lawnmowers, additional workers won't spend much time mowing lawns. They will just get in the way and distract other workers who would otherwise be productive. This causes total output to decrease. Looking at our table, we see that as Blade Runner expands from seven to eight workers, the marginal product is negative right there. Because total output declines from 27 lawns to 26 lawns, there would be no reason to hire an eighth worker who causes total output to decline. To review, it's easy to confuse diminishing marginal product with a negative marginal product, but they are very different. When marginal product is decreasing but still positive, and if we go back to our table, we can see that that is taking place from worker one through seven. It is still positive. Even with when we add worker seven and the marginal product of labor is one, it is still a positive number, right? So when it is still positive, even though it's been decreasing, that is diminishing marginal product. Hiring the additional worker causes total output to rise. But when marginal product is negative, employing more workers actually causes total output to fall, which is what we saw in our table by hiring the eighth worker. The cost of production. What we've learned about production involves inputs and outputs. The inputs such as mowers and workers, and the output, which was the lawns mode, are all measured as quantities in our previous table. But firms are in the business to make profit, which is measured in dollars. In this section, we'll begin to translate our knowledge about production into dollars. The first step is to understand how much it costs to produce different amounts of output. Firms face two different kinds of costs, fixed costs and variable cost. Fixed cost is the cost of a firm's fixed inputs, those inputs whose quantity cannot be changed as the output level changes in the short run. Typical sources of fixed cost include the rent paid for buildings, the cost of equipment, and fees for operating license, licenses. In the long run, when the quantity of all inputs is variable, there is no fixed cost. Firms can spend more or less on buildings, equipment, licenses, and other inputs to best suit their level of production. Variable cost is the cost of the firm's variable inputs. Variable cost changes with the number of units of output produced. Typical sources of variable cost include payments for wages, electricity, and raw materials. Did you get it? How does variable costs differ from fixed costs? Go ahead and share your answer to that question in the discussion forum in Canvas. Um, go ahead and pause the lecture while you do that, and then we will continue our lecture. Our table below illustrates the various types of costs for Blade run Runner lawn mowing company. The first two columns repeat the worker and output information from the production schedule 
which was our previous table. Column 3 here in our table, so just real quick, these two, we've already seen that data in our previous table, the production schedule. Now we have two new pieces of data. We have our fixed cost column here, which is column 3. This shows Blade Runner's fixed costs, which is $80 per day, $40 per lawnmower per day. The fixed cost includes the expense of renting and storing the two lawnmowers. Recall that a firm's fixed cost does not increase as output increases. Thus, the fixed cost is $80 regardless of the number of lawns that are mowed. Column 4 here shows Blade Runner's variable cost, which is what it must pay its workers. The cost does increase as output increases because the company must hire more workers in order to mow more lawns. In the table, the daily wage of each worker is $60, so the variable, so the variable cost is $60 times the number of workers hired. For example, to mow 21 lawns, Blade Runner hires 4 workers, so the variable cost is 60 times 4, which equals $240. So, for workers, 60, which we can see here because it's what we paid our one worker, right? So, 4 times 60 is going to equal our variable cost. And we can do that for each of these. 3 times 60 is going to be 180, etc. To keep things simple, remember, in economics, we often want to simplify our models. To keep things simple, we will suppose that any other variable costs, such as the cost of gasoline for the lawnmowers, are insignificant. So we are simplifying this so that we can see a fixed cost and one variable cost, and we don't have to do a lot of extra math. We just have those two costs to look at. A firm's total cost is the entire amount the firm must spend to produce a spe specified amount of output, found by adding the firm's fixed cost to its variable cost. Blade Runner's total cost is reported in column 5 of our table. For example, the total cost of mowing 24 lawns is... $80 plus $300, and that equals $380. In other words, it is our fixed cost plus our variable cost, which equals our total cost. Firms that want to earn the highest possible profit will seek the cheapest way to produce a given quantity of output. Otherwise, they would be wasting money that could otherwise contribute to their profit. A firm that selects its inputs in order to produce its desired level of output at the lowest cost possible is called a cost minimizer. A firm can only adjust variable inputs to minimize cost. In the long run, all inputs are variable, and Blade Runner could sell all its mowers and change the quantity of any other input. But in the short run, Blade Runner can vary only the number of workers it hires to mow lawns. So minimizing cost in the short run comes down to mowing lawns using as few workers as possible. The costs in our table are the minimum costs for mowing each number of lawns. For example, Blade Runner cannot mow 17 lawns with fewer than three workers. So the lowest possible variable cost of mowing 17 lawns is 3 times 60, which equals $180. In the long run, mowers become a variable input for Blade Runner. Then, cost minimization involves selecting the cheapest combination of mowers and workers to mow any given number of lawns. But for now, we are considering the firm's cost in the short run when Blade Runner cannot adjust the number of mowers. 
This is the end of part one of our lecture. Please start your uh, part two of the lecture on this slide, but you obviously do not need to answer this did you get it question. So go ahead and answer this did you get it question now. What is total cost? Which two numbers are added to find total cost? Share your answer in the discussion forum on Canvas, and then you can stop this video um, and pick up tomorrow for the second half or part B. You will also now need to open up Concept Check Unit 2, Lesson 6, Part A, and complete that concept check. We will have a video conference tomorrow uh, to go over it and to answer any questions that you had about Part A of lecture and that concept check. Tomorrow you can pick up right here on this slide and um, continue with lecture and um, we will see you tomorrow. All right, welcome back to part two or B of our lecture. We're going to go ahead and move forward. You did this, did you get a question yesterday? So now we're going to be looking at the concept of marginal cost. Previously, we explained that marginal cost is the additional cost of doing something one more time. In the context of production, marginal cost is the additional cost of producing one more unit of output. For most goods, the cost of making another unit rises at some point as more is produced. This occurs because of the law of diminishing returns. If each worker adds less to output than the previous worker, then the expenditure on labor to produce each additional unit of output will rise, as it takes more and more workers, or more time from a particular worker, to produce the additional output. Column 6 here of our table shows the marginal cost at various levels of production for Blade Runner. Marginal cost is calculated as the change in total cost divided by the change in output. For example, if Blade Runner increases its output from 12 to 17 lawns, that is an increase of 5. 17 minus 12 equals 5. Total cost, when that happens, rises from 200 to 260, an increase of $60. Again, 260 minus 200 equals 60. So the marginal cost per additional lawn is 60 divided by 5, which equals 12, which is this number here. Again, marginal cost is the amount, sorry, excuse me, marginal cost is figured, is determined by taking the change in output from 12 to 17 and the change in total cost in dividing those changes. Okay. So again, that was 60, which is what this change is right here. This change was 5. So that's 60 divided by 5. And that equals our marginal cost, which in this case is 12. Notice, as we look down the column 6, the marginal cost increases as output increases. 10, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 60. For example, as we just calculated, the marginal cost is 12 to increase output to 17. Sorry, for example, as we just calculated, the marginal cost is $12 to increase output to 7 lawns. Each additional lawn there, right? 
Each of those five extra lawns costs $12 each. But when Blade Runner increases output from 17 to 21 lawns, the marginal cost rises to $15. And a further increase to 24 lawns raises the marginal cost to 20. It becomes increasingly costly to mow additional lawns as the total number of lawns mowed increases. We can see again that increase is shown right here. As we move from mowing six lawns to 12 lawns, now notice the marginal cost doesn't change there because, right, six, the difference between zero and six is six, and the difference between 140 and 80 is 60. So that is 60 divided by 10. Sorry, 60 divided by 6, wrong number. 60 divided by 6, the difference here, equals 10. And because when we add that second worker, they also produce 6 mode lawns, the difference between 12 and 6 is also 6. This difference here is also 60 between 140 and 200. We have the exact same numbers. Thus, marginal cost doesn't increase there. But as we add those extra workers, as we talked about before, that third worker doesn't have a lawnmower to use, so they're doing other things, so they're not as productive, right? They don't add all, so they don't add an additional six lawns per day. They only add an additional five, and that's what we found here, the difference between 17 and 12. And since that difference is five, we still have a $60 change in our total cost over here. But now it's all divided by 5, which raises that number to 12, which is here. And as now the difference between 21 and 17 is going to be 4, right? As that, this number increases, as we saw in our previous table, then 3, then 2, then 1, right? And we can see 1. We would expect that to be $60 <coughs> because our difference, excuse me, between 500 and 440 is $60. 60 divided by 1 is 60. We see that there. All right. Hope that made sense. So let's go ahead and did you get it? What typically happens to marginal cost as output rises? How does the law of diminishing returns help explain this? Try and put that in your own words. Grab wrap your brain around that share your answer in the discussion forum on canvas and go ahead and pause this video while you do that all right we're back we're now going to move on to how a firm decides exactly how much output they should make in other words how much should they supply should they supply a particular price We've seen that total revenue is the money a firm receives from selling goods or services, and that profit is total revenue minus total cost. Profit is also the firm owner's source of income. The lure of profit is a major reason why entrepreneurs start businesses. And once a business is in operation, its owners will generally strive to make the largest possible profit. In this part of the lecture, We'll examine how that is done. The amount of output that gives a firm as much profit as possible is called the firm's profit maximizing output level. How does the firm find this output level? One approach begins with a calculation of the firm's total revenue, which is the price charged multiplied by the quantity sold at each output level. In our table here, we see Blade Runner's total revenue in column eight. And again, total revenue, 
was is um, <clears throat> the price per lawn mode, right? The price times the quantity. So price of 20 here times our output quantity supplied, zero, zero. For one worker, 20 times six is $120. That is how we are arriving at that. So this is output times price. Uh, that is one way to determine total revenue. So again, when Blade Runner mows 17 lawns down here, we times that by 20 for a total of $340. Now that we have total revenue, we are now ready to calculate Blade Runner's profit at each output level, as shown in column nine. Ooh, yellow, kind of is hiding there. All right. <clears throat> the profit earned at a particular level of output is simply the total revenue at that output level, column eight, minus the total cost at that output level, which is column five, right here. For example, when Blade Runner mows 17 lawns, still using yellow now, its total revenue, 340. Total cost, here in column 5, 260. Thus, Blade Runner earns a profit of $80 if it mows 17 lawns, which is the total revenue of 340 minus the total cost. 260. So again, profit is determined by total. Let me change that color. Sorry. Yellow is not very great. Right. So again, this is total revenue minus total cost equals profit. And so we got $80 by taking, right? Uh, well, we got $80 there, but more importantly, we got a profit of $80 when we mow 17 lawns in a day because our total cost for 17 lawns was 260 our total revenue was 340 so we had 340 minus 260 and that equals our 80 dollars once profit is calculated for each output level we can find the profit maximizing output level or levels very easily if you run your finger down, like I'm going to do here, right, we have negative $80. So if we mow zero lawns, we're going to lose $80 because our fixed cost is 80. If we mow six lawns with one worker, we're going to have a loss of $20 because ultimately, right, it's our fixed cost plus our variable cost is greater than our total revenue. That's a difference of $20, in this case, negative $20. At 12 lawns in a day, which we need a minimum of two workers to do, right, we would make a profit of $40. At 17 lawns with three workers, we would make a profit of $80. And at 21 lawns, with four workers, we would make a profit of $100. We also make a profit of $100 at 24 lawns mode in a day with five workers. And then notice at, at 26 lawns with six workers, our profit starts to go back down, right? Because adding that worker here, adding that extra worker, moving from five workers to six workers, only added two lawns. Adding the fifth worker from four workers added three lawns. So we've added less lawns, our costs are factored in there, and we end up with only an $80 profit at 26 lawns. If we mow just one more lawn in this particular example, right, we move to 27 lawns in a day, seven workers, we have to pay that worker, 
that's 60 bucks that decreases our profit down to $40 and eventually we could again lose money which we see here um, at an output level of 26 lawns with eight workers notice 26 twice one with six workers one with eight workers and the one with eight workers we definitely are experiencing a loss we are not earning a profit Previously, we learned that individuals can make good decisions by taking actions that provide a marginal benefit that exceeds the marginal cost. The same type of marginal analysis guides firms to their profit maximizing output level. Because profit is measured in dollars, so is the marginal benefit of producing and selling more output. The additional revenue a firm receives from selling another unit of output is called the firm's marginal revenue. For price-taking firms like Blade Runner in perfectly competitive markets, the price is the same no matter how much output they produce, and the marginal revenue is simply the price of each unit. That is, Blade Runner's marginal revenue is $20, no matter how many lawns it mows. In the future, we will talk about how marginal revenue can fall below the price for monopolies and other firms that must lower their price in order to sell more. But for now, we are assuming a perfectly competitive market, and so marginal revenue is going to be the price of each unit. In our example of Blade Runner, that will be $20. Firms compare the marginal revenue with the marginal cost when deciding whether to increase production. Suppose a firm is considering a new higher output level. If the marginal revenue exceeds the marginal cost for that increase in production, then the additional output will add more to total revenue than to total cost, and profit will rise. By contrast, if the marginal revenue is less than the marginal cost, profit will decline as output increases. This suggests a simple rule for the firm. Increase production as long as marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. Do not increase production if marginal revenue is less than marginal cost. Let's see how this logic works at Blade Runner. If output rises from 0 to 6 lawns, the marginal revenue is $20. Which is the price for each lawn, while the marginal cost is 10. So here's our marginal cost, and here is our marginal revenue. Again, in a perfectly competitive market, marginal revenue is the same as the price per unit, in this case, price per lawn mode, $20. So we can compare these two columns, column 6 and column 7, um, to find um, the marginal benefit and where we will maximize our profit. Because our marginal revenue is 20 greater than our marginal cost, 10, our profit rises. Now, in this case, we're still not making a profit, right? We went from negative 80 to negative 20, but that is still an increase. That is a positive movement, right? Negative 80 to negative 20. So profit rises as output increases to six lawns. We can verify that. The marginal revenue of $20 continues to exceed the marginal cost for all increases in input up to 20 lawns. So in each of these, right, this is going to remain the same 20, our marginal revenue. But we notice, right, that this is, we, marginal revenue is higher than 10 here at 12 lawns, right? That's marginal revenue still higher. Marginal revenue is higher at 17 lawns. 20 is greater than 12. Marginal revenue is higher at 21 lawns. B 
because our marginal cost is 15, marginal revenue is 20, so that's still higher. So we are still going to increase production because every time we add, we mow another lawn, at least at this point, when we get to 21, if we mow one more lawn, we are going to add a little bit more to our um, total revenue and therefore our profits will increase as long as this column, our marginal revenue, is greater than our marginal costs. And we can see this over here because we are increasing in our profits, right? Each of these changes is an increase until we get to 21 lawns mode. This tells us that Blade Runner will hire at least the four workers needed to mow 21 lawns. This is how Blade Runner is going to make this decision. When Blade Runner hires the fifth worker to increase output from 21 to 24 lawns, the marginal revenue and the marginal cost are equal at 20. For this move, each additional lawn adds the same amount to revenue as it adds to cost, 20 and 20. So profit will not change. We see that here. Blade Runner will be indifferent about increasing output from 21 to 24 lawns. The owners might as well flip a coin to decide between these quantities. To simplify our view of these situations, we can assume that the firm does go ahead and produce the last unit or units for which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So when we have a situation where our profit remains the same because our marginal revenue right ends up equaling our marginal cost we're going to assume that the firm is going to go ahead and move to that point of those two being equal and other again marginal revenue equaling marginal cost <clears throat> they probably will not stop here where marginal revenue is still greater than marginal cost. They're going to move to the marginal revenue, marginal cost being equal, because that's going to tell them <coughs> for sure if they add any more output, <coughs> they are going to start to lose profit. Excuse me, <coughs> bit of a cough there. Now let's consider the option to hire a six worker. We'll use a different color. We'll use green now, right? We're going to add. We're going to consider adding that sixth worker. That's going to increase our output from 24 to 26 lawns. For this change, the marginal revenue is 20. That's remaining the same. But notice our marginal cost is $30. It is greater than our marginal revenue of $20. Or to put another way, our marginal revenue is less than our marginal cost. This results in profit falling, in this case to $80. Blade Runner should not make this change. <coughs> in general, the profit maximizing output level can be found where the marginal revenue and the marginal cost are equal. At that output level, <coughs> all changes for which marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost have been exploited. If the marginal rev revenue never equals the marginal cost, <coughs> profit is maximized at the largest quantity for which the marginal revenue exceeds the marginal cost. Blade Runner's marginal cost and marginal revenue are equal at an output of 24 lawns per day. <coughs> Thus, Blade Runner will maximize profit by mowing 24 lawns and earning $100 in daily profit. The information for this quantity of output is bold. I'm going to erase all my markings here so that we can again see <coughs> that I have bolded this level here 
in our table. This is our profit maximizing output level, 24 lawns. All right, did we get it? What is meant by the term marginal revenue? If a firm's marginal revenue <coughs> exceeds its marginal cost, what will happen to the firm's profit if it increases output? Go ahead and share your answer in the discussion forum on Canvas and pause this video. All right, welcome back and we are going to continue. Marginal analysis helps us understand the logic behind the firm supply curve discussed earlier in our unit. Marginal cost is the cost of producing another unit, and marginal revenue is the revenue gained from selling another unit. In a perfectly competitive market, the marginal revenue is the price of the good. If the price is greater than the marginal cost, the firm's profit will rise as it produces more. If the price is below the marginal cost, the firm will earn higher profit by producing less. The fact that marginal cost rises as output increases means that a profit maximizing firm will produce more output only if the price rises. This explains the law of supply. Another did you get it? If the price of a good exceeds the marginal cost of production, does profit increase <clears throat> or decrease if the firm increases output? Why? And go ahead and, oh, <clears throat> stop type there, but go ahead and answer that in Canvas in our discussion form. All right, go ahead and pause the video and type your answer. And now we will continue. What makes an entrepreneur decide to start a firm? The answer is profit. If an entrepreneur thinks a firm can make a profit at some level of output, she or he will have an incentive to take the necessary risks and make the necessary investments to start the firm. We can see from our Blade Runner's table that Blade Runner's total revenue exceeds its total cost at output levels between 12 and 27, so Blade Runner is profitable. An entrepreneur with the information in, table, in the table would decide to go into business supplying lawn mowing services. Entrepreneurs may be hit by unexpected events after going into business. The price of their product could fall or their costs could rise. For some period of time, these events can cause profit to turn negative, even when the firm is producing the best possible output level. When a firm faces a loss, the entrepreneur must decide whether to keep operating or shut down until conditions change. How should the entrepreneur make this critical decision? If the firm's total revenue is below its variable cost, the entrepreneur is wise to shut the firm down. Why? Because a firm's variable cost is paid only if the firm stays open. If the variable cost that can be avoided by shutting down is larger than the revenue to be gained by staying open, losses are minimized by shutting down. For instance, if the price received is $9 per lawn, Blade Runner would have to pay its workers more than it received from customers. If it hired <clears throat> The five workers needed to mow 24 lawns, for example, its variable cost would be 60 times 5 equals $300, and its total revenue would be 9 times 24, which equals $216. Thus, it would lose less by not mowing any lawns. But what if total revenue covers the variable cost, but not the fixed cost? In this case, the firm should stay open. Remember that the firm must pay its fixed costs regardless of whether it produces output or not. So if a firm's total revenue is above its variable cost, even if there are losses, it is better for the firm to remain open and pay off some of the unavoidable fixed cost, rather than shutting down and not earning any revenue to put toward the fixed cost. In the long run, when it is possible to get out of 
rental contracts and avoid other sources of fixed cost, the firm will stay open only if there are no losses. <clears throat> Notice that the decision to start a business and the decision to shut down are based on different criteria. The decision to go into business hinges on the ability to make profit, which occurs if total revenue exceeds total cost. This decision takes both fixed and variable cost into account because total cost is the sum of fixed and variable cost. But a firm should shut down if it cannot cover its variable costs. <coughs> As a result, some firms <coughs> that are incurring losses will continue producing in the short run because their total revenue exceeds their variable cost. Many automakers, for example, have remained in business even after months or years of being unprofitable. Automakers have very large fixed costs associated with their factories and equipment. But during those periods, their total revenue exceeded their variable cost, and so it made sense for them to stay in business. Did you get it? Under what conditions should an entrepreneur go into business to supply a product? Under what conditions should an entrepreneur shut a firm down? Go ahead and um, answer those questions in the discussion forum on Canvas. This is our last slide. This is the end of our lecture for Unit 2, Lesson 6.